Hello, this chapter is about articulations. Um, in the syllabus it says chapter 8. It may vary, um, but with your chapter in your textbook, it should be entitled Articulations. And this has been made available on Moodle, the PowerPoint, lecture notes, handouts. Um, there are two homework assignments that are available on Moodle. One is called Articulations Crossword, and the second is called Dancing Moves. Um, but both of those homeworks you will need to do. Um, I would like you to start them immediately. I will have them, I'll post a due date for them on Moodle separately, but I wanted to make you aware of that now so you can get started. Both of those homework assignments are designed to help you with this chapter. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition, there is a little bit of coloring that will be done, pages 19 and 24, which does cover articulations. So please look into that. Um, but now we're going to actually get started talking about articulations. So moving to the, the slide. So first of all, an articulation, what is that? That is um, the anatomical term for a joint. And a joint occurs whenever you have, or wherever you have, two bones that are meeting. And not all joints are movable. So for example, between two bones in the skull, like the parietal bone and the occipital bone, that is a articulation, but it is not a freely movable joint. So we're going to talk about different types of joints. Um, the structure of the joint will determine how much movement can occur. So just a reminder, structure determines function, and we'll see that with this chapter. And another really neat thing that happens that you definitely will need to know is that the stronger the joint, the less movable it is, the less mobility to have. The more mobility you have at a particular joint, the weaker that joint is. So this is a really important little fact to remember. Moving on to the next slide. Okay, so there's two main ways to classify joints. And I would say is, as you're going through this lecture, print out the handout that's available for you on Moodle. It's a two-page handout and it talks about the different types of joints and then it gives you examples on the next page of specific places where those joints are found, okay? That is going to be really crucial to your um, helping you learn this stuff. So there's two ways you can classify joints. First, you can classify them based on their function. Um, what is the range of motion you have at that joint? Um, what is the function of that joint? or you can classify it based on the structure of the joint. Okay, and so with the structural classification, this is talking just about anatomy. How is that joint put together? Okay, so it's function versus structure. So first we are looking at functional classifications. Okay, so the first type of joint, if we're talking about functional, is a synarthrosis. A synarthrosis is an immovable joint. You're not going to have any movement. What's connecting the bones will be fibrous, like collagen fibers, or cartilage. Um, and some of these joints may fuse over time. Okay, so these names you're definitely going to need to know. The next is the ampiarthrosis, and this is a slightly movable joint. So as you can see, we're moving from not moving to starting to move. So ampiarthrosis, you have a little bit of movement, and you still have fibrous or cartilage connections, just like a synarthrosis. The third type, a diarthrosis, is a freely movable joint. Okay, and these are all synovial joints. And we'll talk about synovial joints, and they're classified based on the type of motion they have. Most of your joints are synovial, the ones that you are move, the ones that you can move. Okay, so you need to know these three terms that they're functional classifications and the movement you get with them. Okay, 
This is a nice um, kind of summary slide. It's similar to the handout that you that I've made available for you. So we have a structural category. We have a functional category. Um, so we just talked about a few of these structural categories. So we have synarthrosis, ampiarthrosis, and diarthrosis. So diarthrosis is a synovial joint. Oh, well, it won't work. Okay, there you go. Um, okay, yeah, so diarthrosis is a synovial joint. Um, and then cartilaginous joints, you can have a synarthrosis or an ampiarthrosis. Fibrous joint, you can have synarthrosis or ampiarthrosis. And then a bony joint, like where the bones have fused, is a synarthrosis. You can also look at a structure of how the bone, the bone is put together. And so we'll talk about these structural types. This is on the second page of your handout. And then we'll talk about the different types of synovial joints, which are right here. Okay, so classification of joints. So this slide is talking about your structural classification. So you have bony, fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. So you need to know those, and these are based, again, on structure. I'm kind of excited I get to write on this. I hope it works for you guys. So bony, that's basically when the bones fuse. A fibrous joint, um, this is going to be held together with dense connective tissue. So some examples like collagen fibers. Okay, so a certain, some examples of fibrous joints, you have a suture, and we have seen a lot of sutural joints in the skull itself, so this is a really good example. Then we have a gomphosis, and a gomphosis is basically a joint where your tooth is attached to the socket in your jaw, and it's attached with what we call periodontal ligaments, which again is essentially collagen fibers, which help hold the tooth into the socket. So that is a joint. That's not a movable joint, but it's a joint. And then you have syndesmosis, and this is where you have sheets of connective tissue that are holding bones together, and the two really good examples are between the tibia fibula in the radius and ulna, where you have sheets that connect the radius and ulna together. And so like when you rotate your forearm, that sheet is helping to hold those two bones together. Okay, third, we have the cartilaginous joints. And there's two categories there. You have synchondrosis and symphysis. Synchondrosis is made of hyaline cartilage. A very good example is the rib cage, where you have cartilage that connects the bone to the sternum, okay? And we know that the most common type of cartilage used in the body is hyaline. A symphysis joint is going to be with fibrocartilage, and there's a few places you can find this. One is the intervertebral discs are made of fibrocartilage, um, so in between each vertebra. You'll also find this at the, the pubic symphysis um, between the two pubis portions of the coxal bone. And one last place you may find a symphysis. Um, oh, no. Forget that part. Okay. Then we're moving on to synovial. And these are freely movable joints again. The joint is encapsulated in a synovial membrane also secretes synovial fluid, which helps with lubrication and reduction of friction. And these are classified based on the kind of movement that can occur. So you have a pivot joint. And also I want to point out to you, you have these different categories of monoaxial, biaxial, and multiaxial. So monoaxial means it can move in one plane. Biaxial means that this joint is able to move in two different planes. Remember our body planes like transverse, sagittal, etc. Um, and then ball and socket and plane are multiaxial, which means two or more planes. So a pivot joint, a good example is your forearm when you rotate your hand up or down. That is a really good example of a pivot joint. 
A hinge joint would be really, a really good example would be your elbow. It only can move in one direction. Your elbow and your knee are two really good examples of hinge joints. Um, there's other examples listed, toes and fingers. A saddle joint um, moves in two different planes, and a good example would be your thumb. See if you can play around with that one and see how that works. Um, an ellipsoid joint you would find at the knuckles of your fingers and then at your wrist itself, so those carpal bones. And then the two multi-axial joints, you have ball and socket and plane. So the ball and socket joint, really good examples would be between the femur and the coxal bone, which we learned about last week. And then also between the humerus and the glenoid fossa for the upper arm. So those are ball and socket. And we know that like the head of the bone is round um, and it fits into a a concave surface, so that's that's very good ball and socket joints. So those are the good examples. And then lastly, plane. These are short bones, hands in the foot, um, hips to spine. We have pictures later I'll show you that will help kind of explain that one a little bit more. Okay, so continuing on, functional classifications, we're going to talk more about each category. So if you remember, a synarthrosis is an immovable joint. Now remember, the flexibility of the joint determines how strong it is. So the less movable it is, the stronger it is. So that would make sense that an immovable joint would be very, very strong. So edges of bones can touch or interlock. So think interlocking makes me think sutures in the skull. And they're like little puzzle pieces. Okay, so four types of synarthrotic joints. You'll need to know these. Again, your handout puts this all in the summary, which is really helpful. So you have suture, skull, gomphosis, this is the teeth, synchondrosis, example would be like the ribs being connected with hyaline cartilage to your sternum, and then the syntosis. Ah, can't quite remember. I believe that one is with your fibrocartilage, like in, intervertebral discs and that the sym pubic symphysis. Okay, synarthrotic joints, so even more in depth. Suture, so more on sutures, we know that bones interlock. They're held together in living bone, even though they're interlocking, they're still held together by fibrous connective tissue. So your sutural joints are very strong um, and you've only been able to see the sutures be slightly flexible in lab when it's an old real skull because that connective tissue has broken down and so you don't have that helping to hold it together anymore. So you only find sutural joints in the skull. Gomphosis, just to remind you, is about your teeth in their sockets. It's held by fibers, or more specifically, we would call them periodontal ligaments. Okay, synchondrosis, and I've already kind of mentioned this to you before. This is cartilage. This is going to be hyaline. I don't know if I can get this to write, hyaline cartilage. Right, please. There we go. Um, and it helps to hold these, it's like a bridge between two bones. So like ribs to sternum. Um, another example, you would have it as the cartilage at the ends of bones where the bones are coming in contact with them. And that helps with connect, um, that helps with reducing friction. And then another um, usable place where you would find this cartilage as at the epispheal plates or either we call them growth plates so when they are still cartilage and dividing and growing in length you it that is made of hyaline cartilage when that cartilage finally ossifies then that growth plate is no longer active and the hyaline cartilage is gone 
Okay, lastly, syntosis again. This is where, oops, bones are fused. Um, a really good example is a metopic suture in the skull. And I would include, I would really encourage you to look up this picture. Look up this term in the images like on Google or Yahoo. It's really interesting. We don't have any examples in our lab of any skulls that have this suture, but it's, it's kind of neat to look at. Um, essentially, basically, your frontal bone starts out as two separate bones and then fuses, and you don't even see the suture from that fusion, except for in rare cases. So I would look this up in Google Images or something. It's pretty cool. Okay. All right, continuing on with functional classifications, amphiarthrosis. And, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> these are slightly movable. So this is different. The other ones were not movable at all. Sorry, I'm still getting used to writing things. Okay, slightly movable joints. They're more freely movable, which means it's going to be not as strong as a joint, okay, because you actually have movement that's occurring. Two types, you have a syndesmosis. This is where bones are connected like ligaments. A really good example would be your femur connected to your patella and your tibia. That's all held together by a bunch of different ligaments. A symphysis. This is where bones are separated by fibrous cartilage. A really good example would be your intravertebral discs. Those are separated by fibrocartilage pads. Um, we've also talked about the pubic symphysis. Okay, then synovial joints, and these are those freely movable joints. And just a reminder, the more movable a joint, the less stable it is. So these are the least stable or strong of all joint types, okay? Um, so most of your bones are going to be synovial joints. They're very flexible, and there are six types of synovial joints, you know, like pivot, um, ball and socket, etc., that move in three different planes. So we have the monoaxial, the biaxial, and the multiaxial. So synovial joints are encapsulated in a joint capsule. And so sometimes we call that an articular capsule because this capsule is at a joint. And so that term articular is always going to refer to a joint. And so these capsules are made of a synovial membrane because it's a synovial joint. And then if you can remember, the synovial membrane is made of different tissue than the other membrane types that we've talked about. The synovial membrane is a connective tissue membrane, but it does secrete synovial fluid. Okay, next slide. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, next slide. Okay, more on synovial joints. So at synovial joints, you're still going to find articular cartilage. And what kind of cartilage do you think it's made out of? It is hyaline. I don't know. Okay, hyaline cartilage. Okay, and... So these are found at the ends of bones that are basically articulating with each other. And you can also find pa um, cartilage pads, like at the knee, that prevent bones from touching. That kind of pad is made of your fibrocartilage, if you remember that. I don't know why it's so hard to write. I apologize. So those pads... Those would be like the meniscus in your own knee. That's fibrocartilage, okay? Um, the synovial fluid that is secreted from this synovial membrane helps lubricate, reduce the friction. Um, those fibrocartilage pads help cushion the joint because you have a lot of weight that's on the joint, especially we're talk if we're talking about the knee. 
as a, your whole body weight from above your knee is resting on that joint. Okay. <clears throat> so synovial fluid, what is this made of? It is basically full of proteoglycans, and it's a slippery type of secretion. It's a, it's not a thick fluid. It's it's a thin fluid. Notice that it's made by fibroblasts. So that would make sense because the synovial membrane is a connective tissue membrane, and so you're going to have fibroblasts associated with it, and they're going to be the ones that are secreting the synovial fluid in addition to maintaining that synovial membrane. So functions of synovial fluid, you have lubrication, distributing nutrients. There's not a blood supply in that joint capsule, so it has to diffuse through in the synovial fluid to the tissues, which is one reason why ligaments and tendons that are involved in part of joint capsules why they take longer to heal because there is not a direct blood supply. Um, less blood supply, the longer it takes to heal. That's why sometimes a sprain or a strain takes longer to heal than an actual break of the bone. And then lastly, shock absorption is also a function. <clears throat> I'm going to change my color to white. Woohoo! Okay, so more on synovial joints. Accessory structures. We've talked, already mentioned the meniscus, that is made of fibrocartilage that helps cushion the joint because you do have a lot of weight on the joint. Then we have fat pads. And so the most common fat pad that we talk about is the popliteal one. And you guys should know where that popliteal fat pad is. And this helps protect the joint, protect the ligaments that are helping to hold the bones together. Um, it also protects articular cartilage. So if we're talking about the knee, it's protecting the cartilage that is at the ends of the joints, um, at the ends of the bones, so your hyaline cartilage, but then it's also protecting your meniscus, or your menisci, because you've got two of them, and that is your fibrocartilage. So there's two types of cartilage associated with the knee. Ligaments help support, they strengthen joints, they help hold bones together. The knee joint is an excellent one because there are so many ligaments involved and they do help stabilize it. Um, but the knee, as a synovial joint, is one of our weaker joints. Okay, So when someone has a sprain, what does that mean? That means that some of the collagen fibers in the ligament itself were torn. Ouch, and that's going to take a longer time to heal again because you have a less of a blood supply. Okay, more accessory structures you may find associated with synovial joints, tendons. And we know that tendons attach muscles to bone. Some of these attachment sites are very close to joints and can be, especially if we're talking about the knee again, Sometimes the attachment point for a tendon will wrap around the joint and attach to the bone below to help stabilize the joint even more. Then we have what's called a bursa, and this is within the synovial joint, within the synovial capsule, and this is kind of like a pocket of synovial fluid, and it forms like a little cushion underneath any tendons that are running over the joint to prevent rubbing and friction. And there'll be a picture of this in just a moment. Okay, things that help stabilize synovial joints. So again, the most stable joints have the least flexibility. So if you're able to limit the range of motion, the more you're able to limit it, limit it the stronger the joint will be. So things that help prevent an injury and help limit movement is you have your joint capsule, you have ligaments, um, you have your meniscus, remember that's fibrocartilage, um, other bones, muscles, fat pads like your popliteal fat pad, tendons, etc. All of these things help stabilize synovial joints. But we know it's not going to be perfect. So this top picture here, oh, I guess I can't be in white 
<laughs> this top picture here is showing kind of like a, just a generic joint. Okay, so it's showing the joint capsule made of synovial um, membrane right here, synovial sac, and that's secreting synovial fluid. So you'll have fluid in here, and the gaps are not this big. They're just shown bigger to kind of help you see it. And then notice you have your hyaline cartilage at the ends of these bones where connections occur. Also cool, you can see the epispheal plate, so you know this is a representation of an adult bone. Okay, looking over here, this is actually showing you a sagittal section of the knee itself. And this one shows you the meniscus, oopsies, and, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. The meniscus, and the meniscus is a fibrocartilage pad, so in your knee you've got two of those, and they help cushion, shock absorb. You also have your synovial membrane, it's full of synovial fluid, and then these bursa, they're represented in kind of green, but it still is a synovial membrane, and it helps cushion. For example, if you look right here, you have a bursa in front of the tibia and then on the other side of the ligament. So this ligament that's right here holding the patella down to that lovely little bump on the tibia, you remember what that's called? You basically have a meniscus on either side to help prevent friction and rubbing whenever you move. So that bursa helps kind of protect the ligament from rubbing on the bone itself, which is really cool. Okay, so certain kinds of injuries that can occur. Dislocation. This is basically um, any bones that are articulating are pushed out of position. So this top picture here is a good one showing the patella being dislocated, um, which I've had friends who've had this happen. Not fun, doesn't feel good. It can cause damage to your ligaments. Um, and you also have lots of ligaments on the all over connecting your knee, even in the center. You have your intercondylar eminence, if you remember that. Helps hold things together. And then you have your joint capsule as well. So it can cause a lot of damage. So that's a dislocation. Next we have a subluxation. And this is considered a partial dislocation. So the example I used here is in the vertebra. So you have your intravertebral foramen where your spinal nerve comes out of. If you lose alignment in between vertebra and it's slightly out of place, so you have a partial dislocation, that can actually put pressure on the spinal nerve, which then causes lots of pain. It can also compress, or if this could be caused by a slip disc, um, which is why your vertebra is not aligned properly. And so this can be very painful, Possibly just a visit to the chiropractor would be enough to fix that. Okay, types of movement. And this is where we're talking about the different planes. Um, so I'm going to focus right down here at the different planes or axes that motion can occur. And if we remember, this is all in the, syn oops, all in the synovial joint category. Oh, I think I know what I was doing wrong. <laughs> Sorry. So monoaxial, it moves in one axis. Okay, that makes sense. Biaxial two, multiaxial in three. Okay. All right, types of movement at synovial joints. And there's terms that we use to describe the types of movements. Um, so the direction of motion or the planes that it is able to move in. And so we will see some examples coming up. Um, so if we're talking about different types of motion, one example is linear motion. We also call that gliding. And this is where you basically have two surfaces, or for example, two bones that are sliding past each other. So good examples of this would be at the wrist, at our carpal bones, or our ankle with our tarsal bones. Those bones just slide past each other and we have this kind of gliding movement, and you may want to try to see if you can make that happen with your own wrist. Okay, other motions, so an angular motion would be flexion, 
And this is where terms start being really helpful for your dancing lady homework. So pay attention to this. Okay, so flexion is angular motion. And so if you are doing flexion, so let's say you're flexing your bicep, you are bringing your forearm closer to your bicep and you're essentially decreasing the angle between your forearm and your upper arm. And so you're reducing the angle between the two elements. So if this is our upper arm, I know it's beautiful, and this is the lower arm, there's our fingers, um, flexion would be bringing the arm up forward and that would reduce this angle, okay? Now extension would be the opposite. You're increasing the angle. And so that would be like extending your arm out Oh, I'm trying to give somebody a muscle here. And so that movement would be the opposite direction, and you're trying to increase the angle there between your brachial, your upper arm, and your lower arm. Okay, other types of movement, hyperextension. And this is, as it says, extension past the anatomical position. So we normally have... These are, these are good examples here of showing you flexion and extension. The one at the neck is a good one. So when you flex your neck, you bend your neck down, try to touch your chin to the chest. Extension back up to normal upright position. If you throw your head backwards, you're increasing the angle even further than normal. That's your hyperextension. And another example you can do is with your leg, okay? or your wrist. So these are really good examples for you to remember. Okay, some more movements. Abduction. So these two movements here, there's only one letter that makes them different. So abduction, this is where you're moving a body part away from the longitudinal axis. So away from the center of the body. And so one good way to remember abduction is that it's taking it away from your body, like it's abducting your arm, so moving it further away. Adduction with AD is moving a body part closer to the midline of your body, okay? So abduction is taking it away. Adduction is moving it towards your longitudinal axis, which is basically the same as your sagittal. Plane. Okay. All right, more movements. Circumduction. This is kind of fun. You, I would recommend you try to do this. Um, so you're doing a circular motion without rotation. And so it's showing this lady her shoulder is fixed. She's using a light to show this, but she is able to move her arm in a lovely circle without rotating her shoulder. Okay, so see if you can do that one. <clears throat> more movements, rotation, two main types of rotation. If you look right here, you have medial or lateral, okay? These are better terms in, um, instead of saying right or left. Um, I would prefer it, but for example, with a dancing lady, you have a rotation at the head, um, and so that might be where your right and left would be appropriate. Okay, so... This is based off of your anatomical position, being in proper anatomical position first, and then having rotation occur. So you can have left or right rotation. The neck is the best example of that. And then you can have medial and lateral rotation. Medial is rotating something closer to the midline of the axis. So if your arm, this is anatomical position here, you rotate your arm medially, so you are basically moving from supination to pronation, that's a medial rotation. If you rotate it out laterally, you, that is called supination. Okay, so you're rotating away from the central axis of the body. <clears throat> okay, so I mentioned supination and pronation, and this will hopefully help describe it a little bit more. All of these terms, again, are things you will need to learn. I know there's a lot of terms in this chapter. Okay, so pronation is essentially when you make a movement, you rotate your arm and 
you're rotating it to palm down. Okay? So if this was a person, it would be they would be lying down with the belly to the floor. So when you hear the word prone, usually you think of someone lying down. They're in a prone position, a more vulnerable position. So pronation would be palm down. Supination would be when you rotate it so that your palm is facing up. Um, one way to remember this is that if you're rotating from pronation to supination, you can say, want some soup? Okay, bear with me. Because when you rotate your palm up, it kind of is in a cupping position and you can pretend you're holding a bowl of soup in your hand. I know that's an awful drawing, okay? So want some soup? Supination is when your palm is facing up. Okay, so more movements. Yay! Okay, inversion. And this would be when you are, you when you're standing, you twist your foot medially or inwards. Um, so if your foot is normally standing like this, there's your little toes, and it's beautiful. Um, your foot would turn inwards a little bit, um, not in a natural way. Okay, so this would be kind of like rolling your ankle. Eversion is the opposite, where you're moving the sole of your foot outwards, which is another form of rolling your ankle. I will show pictures of these on the next exam or quiz, and so you need to know the difference between inversion and eversion, okay? Or I may describe a movement, and you should be able to tell me which type it was. Dorsiflexion is flexion at the ankle, so if this is the heel, and there's our leg, this is where you move your sole of your foot upwards, so you're pointing your toes up, okay? So you're lifting up your toes and you're standing on your heel. Plantar flexion is the opposite, and that's kind of like a ballerina who's standing on her tiptoes. And so she is flexing the top of her foot, extending your ankle down, okay? All right, more movements, opposition. A really great example of this is between your thumb and your forefinger. Um, so you can do that right now. So you're basically, you touch your thumb and forefinger together and move them apart and bring them back together. That's opposition. Protraction, this would be, <coughs> excuse me, for example, if you were, your head was straight, um, in a neutral position, you could protract your jaw, which would basically be like jutting your jaw forward, or you could protract your neck, jut your neck forward, okay? And then retraction is the opposite, where you can retract your neck back. And so there should be some pictures coming up of this. More movements, elevation. This is any movement that is moving superiorly, so you're elevating, you're going up. Depression, um, so for example, if we start with depression and let's say somebody jaws, somebody's jaw drops because they're super shocked about something, that jaw dropping would be depression because the jaw is moving inferiorly. If they close their mouth, that movement of the mandible, the jaw, upwards to close your mouth is elevation, okay? Then we have lateral flexion, and the best example is the vertebral column, moving your vertebral column from side to side, which is also a really great stretch, by the way. Okay, so here we have some pictures of those movements. So eversion versus inversion, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, opposition. So retraction and protraction you can do with the neck or the jaw. So these little red dots kind of represent the joint that we're talking about. So like with the ankle, opposition here, depression, mm -hmm. jaw drop, elevation, closing the mouth, lateral flexion, another one is moving the neck from side to side. Also a really good stretch to do. Okay, so synovial joints, there are six 
classifications of synovial joints. And they are right here. Again, these are in your handout. And we'll talk about each of these. And lovely pictures to help illustrate. So gliding joints, the surfaces are going to be flattened, slightly curved possibly, and have limited motion, so non-axial. So the less motion you have, the more stable the joint. Okay, Hinge joints, you have an angular motion, it's monoaxial, so your elbow is an excellent example, or your knee. And so you can see the hinge joint here. Pivot joints only are able to do rotation. A really good example of a pivot joint is between your atlas and your axis. And basically that articulation point with the dens. So this is helpful stuff since we're learning all of our bones. And then we have ellipsoid joints. Um, and they're kind of an interesting arrangement. And so you have an articular surface with a little bit of a curve to it, so it calls it an oval articular surface, and then the other surface has a depression in it. Okay, so like that reminds me of the, oh, I'm not gonna say. <laughs> so this is able to move in two planes. So two planes, that's more flexibility, so this joint is not gonna be as strong. A saddle joint, so here's a saddle joint here. This would be a good example between them the metacarpal of your thumb and the trapezium, which is the bone, the carpal at the base of your thumb's metacarpal. And it has kind of a saddle-like look and you're able to move it in two planes. So again, remember the more movement, the less stable the joint. And then lastly, we have ball and socket joint and you find that in two places, the shoulder and the hip. And then this is actually triaxial and this is the most um, a vulnerable joint type because it has the most movement. And this is such an important concept to remember, okay? This, sorry, this thing just keeps popping up. Oh, I know why I messed up, sorry. So the most movement, the least stable. Okay, so as I've been hinting all along, a joint can't be very mobile and very strong. There is a trade-off. The trade-off is the greater the mobility, the weaker the joint, or we could also say the less mobility, the stronger the joint. This is a concept you definitely need to know and take away from this chapter. And so joints that are more mobile are supported more by ligaments, by muscles, by tendons to help give that joint more stability. Okay, talking about articulations in between vertebra. So here is our, the range between C2 to L5. Um, and so these articulations are between the superior articulating facet and the inferior articulating facets. And in between the bodies of each vertebra, you have your, what kind of cartilage? Try to, try to think of it. It's going to be your fibro, whoops, cartilage. Okay. Important to remember, that's what you're going to find in between the vertebra. It's tougher, it's stronger, it's great for shock absorption. Okay, so here is a great illustration for intervertebral articulations. Um, so our intervertebral discs, remembering mating of fibrocartilage, they do separate the bodies of the vertebra, so you can see that. So here is an intervertebral disc, so it's in between each body. And it has two important layers to this intervertebral disc, and you can see it in this part of the illustration. You have an annulus fibrosus and a nucleus propulsus. And so I'm going to start with the nucleus propulsus first, because nucleus, usually when we talk about a nucleus, we're talking about the genetic material inside a cell, and it's like this darker circular structure in the center of the cell. And so the nucleus propulsus is in, found in the center of the intervertebral disc. 
it's more of like this gelatinous core and it's very helpful in absorbing shock. The outer layer that surrounds the nucleus propulsus is your annulus fibrosis and this is the tougher outer layer. It's very strong. It actually attaches the disc to the body of the vertebra on both sides. Okay, because each bone you're going to have your periosteum. And so these discs attach to both bodies of vertebra. And then you have a bunch of ligaments that also help give a lot of strength to the vertebral column as well. But specifically the part that absorbs shock is going to be the nucleus propulsus. And then the nucleus fi annulus fibrosis gives a lot of strength to your intervertebral discs. So I'm going to stop here. And chapter 9 is going to have to have two uh, lecture sections for it. So this is the end of section or part one. I've ended on slide 37. And so part two will be from slide 38 to the end. So hopefully this is helpful for you.